All right, Grand Illusion GMT head race here game. Which I'm probably mispronouncing. Like everything. Uh, first off, I really enjoyed this one. Um, now, I got a bunch of things wrong, I'm sure. I got a decent amount of rules, a couple that I caught wrong, uh, maybe some others. I think that's pretty much a, uh, a given, not just for me, but especially for me, in the sense of when you start dealing with uh, a game that starts diverging from the core concepts of wargaming, and this one certainly does, and you start adding all kind of new ways of doing things, and this one has new ways of doing things, ways that aren't that standard, say the SCS uh, standard that kind of covers everything up until maybe 1980. <laughs> Not quite, but uh, a huge proportion of war games in the early days all fit that mold, and still I would say a majority of war games published these days are fitting that mold. It's just they're maybe not the big name. The big name things are things where somebody is trying to go for something far more innovative than, although in some cases size is enough. Or some kind of particularly enthralling conflict, but that seldom does it. Um, combine that with, there were problems with these rules. There are some, uh, things that are not well explained, but you can usually figure them out. For me more, it's the organizational style for the rules, but you know, honestly, I can't think of a way to improve on that. Component quality, got some nice big counters, etc. Probably the biggest thing in it is these oversized hexes, which, you know, I got mixed feelings about. Oh. I think a game of this nature could be done in a much smaller scale or a much smaller board and maybe actually be more manageable that way. Uh, something that you could play at a much smaller table. Some people though are going to really appreciate this. It certainly helps with my eyes. They've been getting worse and worse. You know, I found myself uh, something I was playing recently with the old, because if I bring it out to here, I can't read anymore. Um, which is a bad sign. That wasn't happening with my glasses a couple of years ago. Uh, contacts, it started a couple of years ago. Uh, you got your player aid. No sequence of play on it. No sequence of play anywhere but the rule book. That can be problematic, but you can learn it pretty easily. Uh, the turn chart gives you a lot of the special rules, a lot of the uh, you know ways to get into the special rules. It doesn't give you um, references into the rule book, though, and that's another problem. In a lot of cases, you'll remember a special rule or maybe be reminded of it uh, by some means and then have trouble finding it because although there's a an index or a table of contacts here, there's no actual index. And widespread use of acronyms throughout, all kind of stuff like that that really pisses me off about modern rules writing uh, to add to an already, you know. The point is, people are going to pick on this on the rules because there are some inconsistencies and maybe some omissions or whatever. But like I said, you can figure those out once you're aware of them. What I find tough, uh, just by applying some rationality, uh, what I find a lot tougher is when the organization, etc., doesn't really help me. Uh, problem with that? Well, I think with these innovative designs that don't follow a cookie cutter approach, in the sense that you know the old SPI stuff, every every single rule book looked exactly the same and worked very well that way, except for the ones that didn't, which tended to be the more innovative games. And you know, here you're looking at innovative games in every case. So, it's not going to be completely clear where you're going to find stuff. The thing that I would, uh, the game, the single game that this kind of reminds me the most of is No Retreat. 
not necessarily because of the mechanisms, but because of this feel. It's a fairly small game. There aren't a whole hell of a lot of pieces. Lots and lots of special rules to handle different things. What's a little different in this is it's less of a, less of a chess match. Now, No Retreat has its luck factor in it, but this game has a very heavy luck factor. And for me, of course, that's an advantage. For some competitive players, they want to play something where it's their mind against their opponent's mind and knowing the rules and that's it. You know, those are the two things that combine them. And in particular in this game, there's two things that give a lot of randomization that means you are not going to be able to calculate this sucker out. One is the Fortunes of War Table. This is the big one. You got everything planned and oops, that battle didn't go. The other is the actual combat uh, system. Uh, beyond that, where you're setting up on this battle board and you're rolling to hits and, you know, with any given unit, there's a 1 in 6 chance you do nothing. And that could well be the decision, at least. And that could uh, well be the decision of, you know, an overwhelming attack that should take the battlefield, but it doesn't. Of course, you also have the fortunes of war, which can just cancel the battle or, or, or cause give the defender some option um, to, to get uh, an additional control over what's going to happen or, or change the nature of it. You know, a risky attack could come out coming out really, really well for you where you don't expect it because you get an attacker surprise or you, or you get a route result or something like that where you take something that you didn't think you had any right to take, but it was your only chance at, the, at, at victory or whatever. Um, there's something else I want to talk about there along those lines, but I think I lost my train of thought regarding that. Uh, I think the system is actually a very uh, interesting one in terms of if I, if, if I were going to get into a series of lighter games, and I consider this to be a mid-length lighter game, a mid-sized lighter game. This would be very appealing to me. So for example, No Retreat, I think it's a fantastic game and it's uh, better ironed out than this, but it also has all these kind of special cases. But if there was a system that I really wanted to focus on, I wouldn't go for that. There's something very uh, sort of simple about that, but in terms of the core system, but then you got the cards and the card play uh, doesn't do things uh, quite as well for me as this um, as the core system for this game does. The core system for this with the randomization on the on the fog of war with the combat uh, design that doesn't require a CRT but seems to actually you know really shake things up a little bit and all feels like it works pretty well Unfortunately, I didn't get through the trenches, so I didn't see how well they worked, and, and if the system were to be expanded, this is the trenches of 1914, not the trenches of 15 or 16, which just keep getting, you know, more and more extensive. So, if the system were to be expanded to other, other eras, it would have to be greatly tinkered with to, to adequately uh, handle them, and tanks, and all kind of other stuff. However... I do like the core, and I like the way this feels enough that I, if somebody came up, if uh, Race here came up with something to cover another era uh, in the war, I would be very, very intrigued by trying it. Um, the importance of the rail nets, the importance of the caps, the way they work. Man, most games that have uh, ops points or something like that, I sit there agonizing over my decisions. And this one, yeah, I had to think, but it was that right level of thought because at the end I could say, you know what, I can't be sure what's going to happen if I do things. It's not a simple CRT that I can pretty much say, ah, I got a four out of six chance of taking this hex. It's not at all that. It, it's more like firepower tables or, or, or other kinds of systems 
that I really appreciate more because they take it out of that easily calculable range. Now maybe somebody with a much bigger brain than I am would be AP'd by this because they could take it to that I can almost calculate this point. And maybe someone with much, much less uh, capacity to see what kind of strength they have would be befuddled by this, but I don't think so. I don't think I don't think this is going to get in anybody's way. I think this is going to really work well with the kind of thinking that often ruins some games. The, well, let's see what happens and push your troops forward. But you got to be real careful with some aspects of this game. Maintaining your supply lines, uh, keeping reserve caps if you can without losing the, without the initiative, you know, causing the turn to end when you can't afford it not to. Thoughts like that, these kind of things you learn, but you don't have to uh, do number crunching to get them to work. You have to do kind of a geometry crunching on, on the supply status. Just because so much of the supplies runs through the rail net, and the, that's a very weird uh, distribution. The way the rail net works is, it looks like it works most places, but then there are these hexes that just screw you over if you don't have things. Uh, correctly aligned. And that's kind of neat in the sense that I think the designer really worked hard uh, to get the uh, hexes and the rail map, etc., to work the way he wanted to, to uh, signify those key spaces that one has to fight over to continue the campaign forward. Um, also got the what if scenarios, which allow you to either just kind of predetermine, hey, let's throw this part out, let's throw this part out, let's add some additional troops, let's do this, that, and the other, that would greatly vary uh, the f general flavor of the game and allow you to really test out some different things. And, you know, what the hell, you can make some of your own, too. You, If you don't like uh, the Schlieffen plan and plan 17, if you've got some of the other plans that you know, we're tossed around as kind of, hey, what if this as sort of a, a uh, operational choice that was never really followed and, and never got the kind of support that would have been necessary, but it could have been done over a, a, a few years to prepare for the war a little beforehand. Um, you could take some of the picks that are in La Grande Guerre and say, well, all right, you know, why, why don't I try this what if? Some of them wouldn't work, obviously, but you could loosen some of the restrictions. You could play around with this game a little bit, and I think it would be fairly resilient because the core system does still work pretty damn well. You saw my mistake. I screwed up the Schlieffen plan hexes because I didn't see the, uh, well, I didn't remember the prohibition for the Germans, which was the sensible one. It actually shocked me. It stunned me. I looked for it, and I couldn't find it. All I could find, because of the poor organization of the rule book and of my brain, is uh, the Brits. You know, if again, if my brain, if I had this on a PDF in my head or on line or whatever, yeah, I could search it and probably find what the SP, Schlieffen plan, whatever, hex is every, every mention of them. Doing that would be as painful as searching through the rules, though, continuously. So, you know, that, that doesn't work terribly well for me. Anyway, though, I definitely got a lot of enjoyment out of this. This is one I'm looking forward to playing the post sometime. Uh, that's usually not the case for me. Usually the games that I want to I, I wanna play. In a sense, that can be said as, wow, there's a positive aspect. If you're the kind of person who likes a competitive game, that may well be a pointer towards that. Uh, whether or not I enjoy it again opposed may not be. So, for example, uh, No Retreat, I'm less, I, I enjoy it less than I respect it. This game I enjoyed as much as I respect. I feel like uh, it actually hits that perfect center for me for a more competitive, lighter game that you can teach and play in, 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 in a, uh, a single session or a longish session. And I think uh, it fit in well with that. It strikes me as a, an approachable game, but one where you do have to spend a little bit of time and effort thinking about what's going to happen if you do certain things. Uh, 
whether or not a certain hex is going to be a really terrible thing if you attack. Anyway, it was it was more enjoyable for me than I expected it to be. Uh, you know, with the race here name on it and Paths of Glory, I had a real fear that yeah, I would kind of at best be lukewarm on it, but I'm definitely positive on this one uh, in a way that maybe goes further than how I am positive on most operational level games. I would say this would rate in my high end. Certainly, it's it's in my go-to of, of kind of, hey, if I want an operational game that is kind of simplistic, that's not the OCS or something like that, this is uh, the kind of level that I'd go for. This is the kind of game at that level that I'd go for, as opposed to, say, the No Retreat, as opposed to some of the simplified uh, SCS type stuff. I think this is where I'd head for that. The simplified SCS stuff, hey, that's fine for solo, but it, it usually doesn't um, give me that kind of competitive fun, and I, I got that even solo from this, being able to see, yeah, I'd, I think I'd really enjoy the struggle on the thought process behind each move in this game a lot more than in some games, because I don't have to quite make as much struggle, but it's still there. The reason I don't have to make as much, because there's enough luck in the game that I can just push some pieces and say, well, let's see see what happens here, because, you know, this, I can get sort of that gestalt feel for how the battle's going and make my decisions based on that with a little bit of care about the geometry. Up it goes.